Well, Sara, welcome to Impossible Trade-Offs. I'm excited to have you. Thank you, Katie. Always a pleasure to speak to you. Well, we just finished a very exciting election in India. I know you're doing a lot of, you were doing a lot in the lead up to it and also now after. What are your key takeaways? You know, I would say this election, Katie, was very interesting. You've been somebody who has observed India for a long time. Uh, you know, I, I recall our conversations during the last elections, you were there. And I can tell you this election was even more exciting in some ways because this election was largely fought uh, through social media. I would say uh, social media and digital platforms were the key drivers for this elections for uh, you know both the key coalitions, both uh, Prime Minister Modi's NDA and uh, the Congress's uh, you know led by Rahul Gandhi's uh, you know uh, India Alliance. So so I think that is one of the big dominant takeaways. And as uh, when the social media was too uh, all pervasive, you obviously had to uh, see a lot of misinformation, disinformation coming out during the election. And me and my team in News Mobile, uh, we were really. Uh, you know, it, it was at its peak trying to uh, tell uh, the voters what was the truth because that was very, very important for us. And we made it a point that, uh, uh, you know, uh, we were able to uh, put it out before the voters ahead of time. In fact, uh, one of the things that we did uh, was also to warn India's election commission. In fact, way back uh, ahead of the election in February, I I'd, I'd spoken to the election commission of India that invited me to speak and I told them that, listen, uh, you're going to have a problem in terms of misinformation and disinformation. They did take some safeguards, so it helped, but I would still say a long way to go. Uh, we are to counter uh, disinformation and misinformation narrative. Katie. Thank you. And you know, you, you say that social media and digital platforms, because it's more than just social media, obviously WhatsApp was a big player in all this too, was key to the election. And I'm curious how, I mean, the Congress party and Rahul Gandhi, I mean, I remember in 2014, he didn't even have a Facebook page. And then in 2019, they seem to have been playing a lot of catch up in the digital space compared to Modi and the BJP. And where did you see them make gains in terms of helping to, Modi didn't do as well as everybody thought that he was going to do. Is that partially because his Congress kind of figured out, cracked the digital code? That's a great question. Yes, you are right. Absolutely. I think the uh, Congress and Rahul Gandhi realized that uh, where Prime Minister Modi gained was to get uh, his messaging to a lot of younger voters. And this is what uh, the Congress did this time. I think their social media uh, campaign was uh, in many ways impactful. That's the reason why you see a larger number of seats, even though uh, they are, you know, they've doubled uh, their tally uh, in the parliament, okay, uh, they're nowhere close to the majority mark. Uh, uh, obviously, Prime Minister Modi lost some key, uh, you know, candidates in, in a crucial state like Uttar Pradesh, where he had invested a, a great amount of uh, deal there. So I think the social media gain this wise, this time, certainly, uh, I would say that uh, the Congress and the India Alliance had uh, managed a sizable gain there. You're right on that. And so, and then what about AI? Because obviously AI was the topic du jour and it continues to be around elections in India. We saw, you know, dead politicians come to life um, with AI to endorse folks and all of that. What, I mean, I, I'm curious to see how, what you saw in AI in terms of the mis and disinformation, but then also were there some legitimate ways that campaigns were using it that you found intriguing? Well, you know, we we were preparing ourselves as a, a global fact checker on how uh, parties may uh, use generative AI uh, to, uh, you know, during the campaign or or even on misinformation, disinformation. In fact, there was plenty of it from both sides. Let me say it. Uh, what our analysis found was that both sides uh, or uh, people uh, who were linked to them, they were using it. But I would say that uh, during the Indian election, uh, the kind of sophistication of uh, AI that's been happening in many other parts of the world wasn't there. So it was not uh, difficult for us uh, to detect it. But yes, uh, there were some cases, you know, where were some false audio of a particular leader that was used, uh, you know, to call out uh, a certain community. Or uh, there were in some cases, uh, you know, the videos that were circulated, which was also true. So I would say, a generative AI was at play, but not at the sophisticated level 
uh, that uh, has been there in many other countries. And I would also, uh, one thing I really want to call out, and that's something, you know, you follow national security as well, very closely. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of misinformation, disinformation also originating from, uh, you know, hired guns from third countries. So I, uh, you know, they're, they're, some of them, uh, you know, sitting in East Europe, doing it uh, for, a, for a price. So, so these hired guns have been used all over the world. So they are, so, so there is a whole community and that's the reason why the world has to be concerned about uh, AI, generative AI, because you know, the US is, uh, you know, undergoing elections, November is going to be crucial and we have to be really watchful for how uh, the impact of AI is going to happen on the US election. So I think the threat, there's a clear and present danger from AI, uh, really, uh, you know, uh, related uh, disinformation that exists and we really need to counter that effectively, Katie. Another area where um, I was really interested in, you know, this has been used for many elections in the past, but is WhatsApp. Um, and WhatsApp is something that's also now finally growing in the United States. It right. is like going to be a, probably a player in the U U.S. election. It's something that has been a player for many times in the India elections. It's not necessarily social media. It's, it's a messaging app. How have you seen campaigns use WhatsApp to communicate with voters? Well, uh, Katie, uh, you know, I think uh, you've uh, got the right question on WhatsApp. We have been thinking about it. We have been strategizing about it. But I, I have to say that a lot more has to be done because WhatsApp has been used uh, to a great, uh, you know, instance by the Asian American community. A lot of uh, immigrants use WhatsApp and it's growing. That's the reason why uh, there is a urgent need for WhatsApp also to make sure that uh, if you have to uh, tackle misinformation, disinformation related to the U.S. elections. You have to create awareness amongst underserved communities, amongst uh, Asian Americans, a lot of Latinos also using it. So I think uh, this is uh, uncharted territory so far, and I think a long, uh, you know, a lot of efforts need to be done because WhatsApp, like for instance, uh, you know, we work. Uh, they have something called channels. Uh, we at News Mobile, in fact, we have almost 1.9 million followers. A lot of them are from uh, the diaspora here, Asian Americans. I would say uh, that uh, the messaging has to be emphatic. Uh, you have to create media literacy for them because it's very, very important because one small messaging can also make sure that uh, some of these people may not even vote because that's what you know has been happening in some elections where a certain community uh, has been targeted to say that, hey, uh, you know, a rumor has been circulated on a certain platform and uh, that has led to voter suppression. So I think, uh, you know, I would say, I hope that Meta is also taking stock of it to make sure uh, that WhatsApp, uh, they take corrective action and also on YouTube, by the way. I would say a lot of them are consumers of YouTube and that is where uh, YouTube also has to take uh, effective measures. So far they have taken uh, measures, but they have not been very proactive. I think that is where uh, YouTube has to uh, really create guardrails around it on how uh, AI generated, uh, you know, disinformation is actually curbed. And especially you need domain experts uh, who can also distinguish between different languages because often what's been happening is it's not so much in English alone. It's happening in the regional languages. It's happening in the languages which, uh, uh, you know, these communities are speaking. So that's the reason why you need more impactful work there by uh, independent fact checkers who can actually detect this uh, early on. Katie. Another trend that I've been seeing in the last couple of years, but particularly this year, is engaging influencers. Influencers who have their own audiences on these platforms. And is that something that but both parties and many of the candidates did? And, and what did that look like? Well, absolutely, yes. Influencers, you know, using influencers uh, uh, was done by both parties. In fact, uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, created, uh, in fact, his ministry, the Ministry of uh, IT uh, under him. They created a whole influencer awards, uh, creator awards, where a lot of uh, creators were awarded. There were some uh, influencers on the other side, you know, who obviously uh, were anti-government, who took a different stand. They've been, and they've been getting uh, you know, millions of hits uh, on their videos. So yes, uh, this election was also about uh, influence, but, uh, influences, but I would still say that, uh, you know, largely people followed more established uh, digital platforms than the influences alone. Again, uh, you know, I think uh, one of the things is as a fact checker, we saw 
a, a, a surge in traffic. So I'm glad that our messaging was also going through. And as I mentioned about the WhatsApp channels example, you know, uh, getting uh, within a span of few months, 1.9 million uh, at a short time was uh, a testament of the fact that people were consuming our fact checks, uh, which, which is a good, healthy trend. And I think we were able to uh, help in uh, creating and maintaining election integrity. And I think we played a small role at News Mobile and I'm very proud of that. But yes, a long way to go. A lot more has to be done because even in the run up, uh, the government has been formed, uh, but you will see a parliament session coming up, which is going to be stormy. So we, uh, our work goes on, as you know yourself, uh, the work of a fact checker never stops. Um, what with the last, I got a couple more questions. I feel like yeah. we could talk for hours about all yeah. of this, but um, what lessons would you give to other fact checkers that are, you know, they have a, we've got French, UK elections, US elections. There's a lot of elections yet to come. What are some things that you all learned about what was most effective in getting your messages out to voters? You know, one, I would say that uh, uh, expect the, un, you know, unexpected. Anything you don't see, uh, so you have to be geared for that. And we were preparing uh, last year itself. You know, we knew exactly, uh, we had done in some ways simulation. We had also mapped out certain areas from where we felt are going to be more sensitive. So you need to get your demo domain experts in. We also had uh, teams where we had, uh, you know, the last mile experts. So if we were not able to verify a certain information, we would then refer it to our local reporter on the ground to make sure that we were able to uh, check it uh, from the district authorities. We had already, as I've mentioned to you, uh, we had established a link with the election commission. So here as well, I would advise that, you know, the local election authority is very, very important because it works both ways, because sometimes you are able to sensitize them. Sometimes you get the authentic information and you have to disseminate it fast. The second thing is make sure that your distribution channels, wherever you are distributing your content, that is very impactful. Make sure that you're sharing it, uh, you know, as much as you possible. The third thing, very important to, I would say the highlight, the importance of media literacy. We really, we ran a campaign, uh, you know, along with some big tech platforms to make sure that we were targeting uh, the last mile voter, which was the younger voter in the villages. Similarly, I would say that in the run-up to US elections, very, very important to create uh, a sensitization campaign for underserved communities. We mentioned about Asian Americans, uh, uh, their regional languages, you know, Latinos obviously uh, are, are a big chunk of voters as well. So the US elections, I would say that has to be there and also uh, be be uh, you know watchful for uh, the false narrative that is going around which is uh, particularly targeted against uh, again uh, underserved communities because you know that leads to voter suppression and that is something which is really really a great danger in a democracy which any fact checker any journalist has to watch out for so these are my f a few takeaways and i would say that uh, you know uh, again uh, re-emphasizing the point that you have to be vigilant 24 by 7. Also, uh, one more thing, collaborate with other fellow fact checkers. We did that as well. We, we wherever we can, uh, we it's, it's a collaborative thing because, you know, it's a power of many joining hands together. And I'm very happy that, you know, uh, we at News Mobile, we are here in the US as well. And we'll be very happy to collaborate with fellow fact checkers to provide them the domain specific and the language specific fact skill that some of them lack. Katie. Last question, and it's kind of similar following on that, but I want to zoom out just kind of like the overall politics. So I was thinking over the weekend, yeah. you know, in 2016, the Philippines election um, was sort of a canary in the coal mine, if you will, because we had Brexit a month later, and then you had the surprise Trump win. I'm sort of wondering if India might be a little bit of that canary in the coal mine for 2024, because we now have a UK election again a month later, and then we have another US election. Um, that the world's very different than what it was in 2016. And so, A, I'm kind of curious just politically, if there's something that you think that people should take away and be paying attention to about where the world is going and where India might be a leading indicator on that. And second, a little bit of predictions of how is Modi gonna do as a coalition prime minister? Like, do you yeah. think that we will make it the full five years? Do you think there's a chance that is he going to be able to hold it together? I'm curious. Well, uh, let me take the second question first, because a lot of people, in fact, have been asking me here in uh, DC as well, uh, how is going to pan out? 
it's not going to be the same government what it was so obviously he will have lesser elbow room to do certain things uh because the coalition partners i've watched it very closely uh, i served two terms on the media advisory committee of parliament of india as a journalist uh so i can tell you uh the coalition partners he has one which is a south india party uh, the telugu desam uh, the other one is jeu uh, which is from bihar those are two big coalition partners they obviously are going to extract their own pound of flesh so that's uh, will limit his ability uh, to function but by actually repeating the same cabinet uh, of ministers he had earlier he has indicated that he will be more assertive uh it also remains to be seen whether on key issues which were fundamental to bjp they're going to push the agenda or not but i would say on issues like foreign policy on issues like uh, uh you know economy there's going to be a consensus yes there will be some uh you know uh, some uh, i would say some focus area like for instance when it comes to uh you know uh, dealing with the us a lot more focus will be on consular issues a delay of visas for it professionals because a lot of uh, their own constituents of his coalition partners are dependent on that but i don't see a radical shift here but certainly his ability to do uh, you know uh, a whole uh, 360 degree change uh, will be limited and i always say that in democracy uh, you know the voters show you the mirror so uh, and and if you see uh, there are people who have been uh, who were faces who were very powerful cabinet ministers they lost in the election so voters send them a message saying that hey uh, there is a certain course correction you have to do yes they were the largest party and they have managed to form the government and i don't see uh, you know a threat to the government as such because you know they have the numbers the opposition block even though uh, because they uh, together are still uh, you know far away but you know politics is the art of impossible you can't predict anything but yes uh, on the first question there is a clear messaging uh, and i would say voters are supreme so any country as long as the voters decide uh, to vote in a free and a fair election they can you know uh, decide to change whoever is ruling the country so you as a voter has that opportunity uh, you have to make the decision or whatever you feel is right for your country to preserve your democracy and you can make it happen i think that again the preeminence of a voter and especially the younger voters uh, that has come out in in elections and i think uh, that's a message to voters all across in the countries in the us which is going to vote uh, in some of the other countries uk which is going to vote in other countries across the globe kt I love that. Well, sir, thank you so much for joining us and I hope to get you back on to talk even more in depth about everything India. Thank you.